I forgot to also mention the chat down below. And if you guys aren't familiar with the Zoom controls, um, We'll try to do our best to pause in between sessions, but if, I mean, between topics, but if you have questions that come up, feel free to type them in the chat. And after we pause for, um, you know, a gap between the different topics, um, I can always ask the presenters what's going on. I mean, ask, ask the presenters the questions that you enter in the chat, or if you don't have a good microphone or a great connection, feel free to enter those, those questions there too. And I'm happy to serve them up to the presenters. But with that, we're at 6.04. I guess we can get started, Richard. Yeah, let's go for it. So, yeah, so um, I would say good afternoon, everyone, but I'm probably the only one here joining from the UK. Uh, so good morning to everyone else. Um, maybe good evening to some people if you're, you're quite dedicated. So, yeah, Probe 101, hopefully quite self-explanatory. We're going to be going over some of the, the basics, really, of how to use your probe, how to control it with infusion. And then we've got some, some representatives from Haas Allendale here that are gonna hopefully be um, explaining a little bit more about how to get your probe and some just general maintenance and some real top tips on, on keeping your probe accurate and working well. As Rob said, um, we want this to be quite informal. Um, please just jump in. I'm gonna give people lots of chances to um, answer questions, but you know, as long as you're not interrupting me every 10 seconds, feel free just to, to speak up when you when you need to. Um, yeah, it's going to be recorded, so please don't worry that if you've missed something, um, it'll be, be available on on YouTube then once we upload this. So yeah, thanks very much everyone for spending the time doing this, and let's get started. So again. A little bit more about myself. Um, I'm a, a process specialist from the, the Fusion 360 team. So basically what that means is anything from doing webinars like this to doing content on YouTube to working with the developers and trying to implement your functionality, testing out different things, you name it, they try and get us involved into doing it. Um, you might be surprised, but the, the UK is actually one of the main places where a lot of the, the camera manufa manufacture functionality is actually developed. Um, it is developed all over the world. We've got a big hub um, in Birmingham uh, developing the software. So we've got a, a large tech center as well. So that's sort of me. Um, I'll let Rob quickly do, uh, do his two seconds. Awesome. Thanks, nice, Richard. So um, my name is Rob Giao. I basically manage some of the partnerships for Fusion 360. So I work with uh, different hardware vendors and um, you know, basically we're, we're trying to collectively work on the experience for Fusion 360, the user experience through, through Fusion 360 by working with different partnerships. Um, I know it sounds, uh, I get some feedback. Does anyone else have that? Uh, anyway, as yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, and then we've got Miles here from uh, Haas Allendale as well. Uh, Miles, one of the applications engineers uh, from New Jersey uh, for the Haas HFO, uh, where we, you know, sell Haas, do a lot of training on the Haas, uh, and it kind of integrate robots in it. Yeah, perfect. So, so you've probably noticed we're using Zoom for this call. Um, I mean, thankfully, everyone at the moment um, is muted. We're only asking that because inevitably you'll forget um, that you've got your microphone on and you'll be having a chat to someone else in the room and we'll all be hearing your conversations. So just as a bit of a courtesy to everyone, just please make sure you mute unless you're asking a question. If you are having issues with the audio, there's a little up arrow next to the microphone. Um, that allows you to select between different microphones and select between um, different um, videos if you want to share your video as well. You know, we're not going to make anyone share the video, but please feel free to. It makes everything a bit more personal for, for us as well. So, yeah, there's also the chat if you don't want to speak up. Feel free to do the chat, but please just go to everyone because, um, of course, I can't monitor it all the time, neither can Rob or, or Miles. So if you just do the chat to everyone uh, and then we'll do our best to, to answer those questions as they come up. So the agenda for today, we're going to have a quick look at calibration. Um, I was want to put this in because there's no point using the probe if you don't really understand how it works. Uh, and there's some quite key things 
in the calibration that you sort of don't need to really know the ins and outs and the calculations behind, but it's really good just to have an appreciation of, of why do we have to calibrate the probe? Why is it different to calibrating at all, for example? You know, why can't I just do it on my shadow graph? Um, and then we're going to quick look into the CAN cycles. So depending on what machine you've got, be it a Haas, be it a Mazak, you know, you're going to probably have some CAN cycles that we can call from inside of Fusion. We can then look at some non-prismatic inspection. So that's going to be all about what we call inspect surface. So where you can place any point anywhere on a part and then report that graphically inside of the product. So part alignment is a bit like Pro WCS, but that next level up, it's doing that. It's combining the non-prismatic inspection with part alignment. And then we're going to show you a bit about reporting. So how at the end of all this, you could actually give your end customer a, a nice printed report to go along with their products. And then Miles is going to jump in and say, talk about how we actually program this from the control. So he's going to talk about the calibration and actually doing it, whereas I'm going to talk more about the, the theories behind it. And then just some top tips and some, some real, real good points about maintaining the probe um, and how to make sure your, your probe never dies on you. So one thing actually I do want to mention is if you see the, the little um, blue spanner next to some of those items, these are extension based items. So for those of you that don't know, um, you've got the, the base level of fusion, which everyone's entitled to um, the same if you're on a trial or on a paid commercial license, but then we offer a manufacturing extension that is a level above that, which allows you to have some real specialist tools. There's a lot of things in there with metal additive, with some real advanced tool paths, and then some of the more advanced probing stuff in there as well. But what we have done is because of the current situation that we're all in, we do want to sort of show our support. So there is actually an extended access program where this currently is free through till May the 31st. So before where you had the little icon in the top right of Fusion, um, you can now click on that and it says you've got free access granted. So this is a perfect time for you to actually use these tools. You know, they're free for you to use at the moment, make the most out of them and just real, really see the value. You know, when we consider the price of this normally is 125 cloud credits for 30 days, you know, I bet a lot of you spend more on coffee than that. So, you know, use these tools while they're free, really get the most out of them. And hopefully uh, you'll see the value when we all come out the other side of this, uh, this crisis we're all in at the moment. So let's get straight into calibration then. Uh, I've taken this topic first because it's probably the most boring. So I try try while everyone's still awake a little bit to uh, to go for this one uh, so I don't lose you all at the end of the presentation. So there's three main values that we care about when we talk about calibration. The one is the calibrated radii. So think of this as like tool diameter. The next one is calibrated length. Funnily enough, it's a bit like tool length. And then the third one, which we don't really do when we look at subtractive milling tools, is eccentricity or runout. Yes, we might have different quality holders that have some have better runout than others. You know, like a side lock is going to have more runout than a hydro grip tool holder. Um, but we don't ever really measure it with a milling tool because there's nothing we can do about it. If we've got runout, then we have to fix the problem mechanically. There's nothing we can do inside of the coordinates of the machine to actually fix that but in a probe there is. So calibrated radii, we have to sort of know a little bit about what's going on here. So when we probe, we do a G31 move rather than a G1. Now you probably never realize this when you're using the CAN cycles because it's all done for you automatically in the background. But what a G31 move is doing, a bit like a G1, you know, you start where your current position is, you then have that end point you're traveling to and you do that full direction from the start to the end. But with a G31, all the time it's doing that linear move. It's waiting for a signal to say, stop that move. We call it the high speed skip. Um, that's all it's effectively doing. It's doing that linear move from your current position to the end position. But if it gets a signal anywhere in between, between those two points, it will stop the machine and carry on to the next line. So why does this matter with calibration? 
So the big one on here is delay. So where we've actually got on the left there, so we're moving our machine, you know, we started at X10, we're moving over, we're at X15.45. By the way, all this will be in millimeters. I am English, so please excuse me if you think I'm talking in inches here and you think bloody hell, 0.1 inches is a long way of mechanical delay. This is all in millimeters. So we've touched at 15.45. Now we're probably gonna to have to travel about another 0.1 for the switches inside the probe to actually be triggered and say, yes, we have now triggered, we have made contact. And then we've actually got an electrical delay from when that signal goes from the probe to the controller and the controller then stops and records that position. So this is the electrical and mechanical delay that's happening while we're probing every time. And that's where we have to calibrate our radii because it has to take into account this delay because we actually touched at 15.45, but we recorded 15.6. So we just have to know that delay and then we, we work that out. And we do that by using like the calibrated ring gauges that you use or the spheres. You know, we use a, a known entity, you know, a calibrated ring, and we know that we're going to touch it at you know, if it's a 50 millimeter ring, we're going to touch it at 25 in the X, 25 in the Y, minus 25 in the X, minus 25 in the Y. So because we know those physical touch points and we know the stop and record points, we can work out how much electrical and mechanical delay we have got. So, yeah. So that's the whole reason why this is a bit different to calibrating a subtractive tool. You know, we don't ever worry about this with a, an end mill because an end mill is a nice normally a solid piece of tungsten carbide. It doesn't need this whole delay in the process. So the length is very similar. So the tool length, much like any tool, is from the gauge face up in the spindle nose, right down to the tool tip. But it's very, very similar to the, the calibrated radii. The calibrated length needs to look at the way it physically touched. It's then gonna keep traveling down slightly you know, it's then going to trigger. It's then going to go down a little bit more before it stops and records. And then that length there where it stops and records is the tool length. So be really careful here. You can't just take your tool on the shadow graph or on, you know, you might have a, a Hamer presetter. You can't just measure it on that, put that number into the tool table and carry on. You can do that to set it up first but you always need to run one of the calibration cycles on the machine. Because if you set it up on a presetter, you're gonna be doing that physical touch tool length, but we need to actually calibrate it at the point where it records the measurements. Because of course, when we measure, we are using those recording measurements. So that's what we need to have as our tool length then. So yeah. And then the final value here is called eccentricity or, or run out. Um, so, Hopefully a lot of you have, have had the fun of, of what I call the calibration dance, which is where you've got a, a DTI sitting on your probe and you're rotating the spindle around and you, you tweak one of the grub screws one way and then you go the wrong way and then you have to go back the other way. You know, I unfortunately spend far too long having to do this. I'm, I could get a lot better at it, but this is taking out the majority of that run out you know, um, but we can only get so accurate, you know, we can't spend our whole life sitting there trying to go down to one micron in run out. So what we do is when we actually run our calibration cycle, as well as doing the radii, it's also going to look at calibrating this run out. So a bit exaggerated there, the front view and the left hand view is our probe is very rarely perfectly along the spindle center line. So if we look at the bottom view, We've got the spindle center line is X and Y zero. That is all the machine knows. The machine only ever knows it's X and Y center line of the spindle. We've then got the probe center line of that ruby. And we're looking at the difference between the center line of the ruby and the center line of the spindle. So all it is is normally just an X and Y value to say, right, the ruby is a little bit over to the left in the X, a little bit towards me in the Y. And that's really all the values are. Um, 
but hopefully just sort of knowing those values, knowing what they're doing is going to give everyone a bit of an appreciation of, of why we need to calibrate the probe so much. One thing that's really key on here, if you've got something like a BT40 spindle, the probe can go in two different ways. So it can go in you know, one way or you can spin it around and put it in the other. There's nothing stopping a BT40 tool in going 180 degrees in where it was calibrated. As you can imagine, that has huge impacts on this eccentricity or the run out. Because suddenly rather than, rather than the ruby being in this sort of top left quadrant, you're now in the, the bottom right. So you've inverted your, your X and Ys. Um, they're now no longer negative and positive, they'll be positive and negative. So that has a huge impact. So top tip, whenever you're doing any probe maintenance and taking it out the spindle, do an MDI, do an M19, which is a spindle orientation command, and then put the spindle in an orientation. Because what you might find is, you'll do a tool change, you'll put the tool in the spindle, and then it might rotate slightly. You take that out, and you've suddenly forgotten now which way does that probe go back in? So if you do an M19, make note of the probe and the way it's facing you. So, you know, there's always a logo and a, and a name on any probe. So just make a note of which way it faces you. I've even seen some customers get a pen marker and actually put a pen marker on to say, this is the bit that faces me. So you do the M19, you take the probe out the spindle, you know, you do your maintenance on it, you change your batteries or you change your styling if you need to. Um, and then I would always run an M19 again because you don't know if that's rotating somehow. Once you run that M19 again, then you can put that probe back into the spindle knowing that you put it in in the same location. So that's just some really important stuff there that you do need to do uh, to make sure you get accurate results. Okay, um, right. So how often should we be calibrating? So the, the, how often do you calibrate your tools is a question I tend to ask people. Well, normally you change, you calibrate your tool when you change your tool. Uh, that's because when a tool wears, you tend to throw it away. Now, probes don't really wear. There's, there's very, very little um, force that ever goes on the end of that probe. So sort of the, the non-negotiables, I would say, when you have to calibrate your probe is when you've done a machine reset as in you've actually reset the machine back to some defaults because the chances are the variables that you store the data in have been reset. If you ever change the styly, so the actual threaded bit on the end, if you ever change that, of course you definitely need to recalibrate. If you've actually changed the probe body itself, then you definitely need to recalibrate. And if you ever had a, a probe incident, so uh, hopefully no one on the call has ever, ever had that heart-wrenching feeling when you snap a probe. Um, but even if you've had you know, a minor mishap with the probe or a common one is noticing that it's loose, um, you know, then I would always recommend you calibrate your probe. Mentioning about how the probe's loose, I, I can't mention the amount of times that you know, I've had people call me up saying, I'm having problems with my probe, it's giving me really random results. And we found out that the, the actual styly is just loose inside of the body. You know, I never advise putting thread lock on these because you don't want to damage the actual probe when you, when you remove it. Um, they do occasionally work loose from time to time, but that's just a case of your general probe maintenance. Miles is going to talk about this later, you know, how to take care of the probe. Um, but you just want to, you know, every couple of weeks, depending on how much you're using the probe, just check it, you know, maybe, um, get the Allen key out or the special key you get from Renishaw, for example, and just make sure that's tight enough. You know, if you do find that it was loose, then of course we recommend recalibrating the probe. So yeah, so before I dive into the sort of probe WCS, has anyone got any, any questions on calibration? So either just, just speak up on mute or, or type in the chat. I think either, either everyone's happy or everyone's asleep. I'm not quite sure which one's going on there. So, <laughs> so right, so we're going to can cycle. Um, so yeah, so we've got, we've got Miles from Haas here today. So we are going to be using Haas as our, you know, our generic example, but this is the same if you've got a, a Heidenheim controller or a Siemens controller, for example. 
we're going to be calling these can cycles through. So, so for the Pro WCS, um, there's a big difference between doing this from Fusion or what Miles will explain later and doing this on your control. We are not setting a datum inside of Fusion, we're refining the datum. And the, the big difference between those two is the difference between absolute and incremental. So for those of you that are unfortunately a bit like me and know, know a lot of M codes and G codes, you know that you know, G90 and G91 go between absolute and incremental. So from Fusion, we are always working in absolute coordinates. So we need to know where the part roughly is before we do WCS probing from Fusion. You can't just put your part randomly on your machine bed and then you know, hit, the, hit, hit the cycle start and hope that we find it. You need to roughly set this up beforehand. You, know, you don't need to be very accurate. You could just hand wheel the probe over the corner and hit part zero set on X, Y, and Z. You, know, you don't need to set it up perfectly but you need to make sure that we're within the rough distance um, so we can actually find the part. So that's the big difference is what I like to say in Fusion we're doing is we're refining the data. We're not setting that data, we are refining it. So yeah, so let's quickly have a look at how we actually do this inside the product. So hopefully a lot of you have, uh, have seen our Autodesk bottle openers before. If not, then you must have been living under a rock for the last year because this is pretty much every demo that we've... Uh, that we've done uh, quite a few of our, our shows, AU London, AU Vegas. Um, so what I'm going to do is there's a couple of ways of getting to Pro WCS. It's even the setup here, WCS. Or well, now we're expanding a lot of our probing. We've actually got a probing tab. So we've got our probing tab and we've got Pro WCS there. So the first thing is it's chosen the correct tool for me. That's because I've only got one probe um, on our half, so it's done that. But if you need to change your tool, of course, you load up your tool library and then you can go through and, and set the correct tool that you need. If you need to make a new tool, you can go and create a new tool, create a new probe. And I don't need to explain exactly what the diameter and body length means, but you get the picture. You can actually go through then and set these up. So make sure you've got the right probe selected on there. We now go into the real, real main body of this probing. So that's the geometry tab. So I want to probe the rectangle of this block. So I need to click on that top surface and it's going to guess then that I want to probe the rectangle. So that's perfect. That's exactly what I want to do. We've now got a couple of different values. So we've got approach and we've got over travel. I mean, one thing, I don't know how new people are to Fusion on the call, but we spend a lot of time making sure these tool tips um, are as clear as we can. So if you're ever worried about what something might do on the machine, feel free, just hover over a command and it's going to hopefully give you a really nice picture and a little bit more explanation about what that does. So the approach is the distance from when we expect to contact the part. So what I've got here is I expect to contact the part there and I'm going to go four millimeters back for this move here. So you can see if I just change that to 15, make it really obvious what's going on. It's going to go back 15 millimeters from where it thinks it should be touching, and then it's going to move all the way along. So, of course, that's a little bit safer, but you've got to think of the feed rate that's happening at. This is quite a slow feed rate, so you don't want to put that at 15 if you don't need to be at 15. I sort of talk, tell people, how far out do you think the part is, and then add a little bit of safety factor in there. So if I reckon the part could be two millimeters to the left or right or front or back, you know, I'll probably set that to four millimeters. So that's how far I think it's going to be incorrect, plus a little bit of safety factor on there. We then look at over travel. Now we don't actually display this on the tool path um, because it would scare everyone that it's going into the part. But you've got to think as much as this part could be oversized and the probe could trigger early, the probe could actually be undersized. So where we've got our expected contact points, we actually need to carry on traveling past that point and actually search for the part. And this is what we call our over travel. So I normally, to be honest, just have an even number um, between those two. So I just have that as four and four. And what that's gonna mean is I'm gonna do this, this move here over the top. 
I'm going to come down four millimeters away from the surface. I'm going to move four millimeters and hope that I touch. If I don't touch, I'm going to carry on for another four before I error. Now on a harsh, you'll get an error. I think it's something like um, surface not found. Basically, that's saying that you were expected to find the surface, but you didn't. So there's a big problem there. So that's pretty much what we need to know for over travel and approach. Heights won't be anything new to anyone who's used Fusion. For those of you that are new, uh, you can either drag these or you can actually move them by a numerical value. The one that probably is a bit new to people is this here. You can do probing top surface on the bottom height. So this is saying how far down the part do you want to probe? So let's say you might have a, a chamfer on your billet that's not modeled. You definitely want to make sure you're not going to risk hitting that chamfer. So you want to bring this down to a good value that's going to hopefully reduce the risk of you ever hitting anything and getting some you know, anomalies or bad results in your probing. So that's unfortunately where a lot of the mistakes happen is when you have like a bad result, a bad result come back from the probe. You know, let's say there was a big bit of swarf on the side or a chamfer that you didn't know that was there and you probe it and then you have problems because it updates the WCS. So I'm gonna go with five millimeters. I know I haven't got a chamfer on this. There's a slight rolled over edge where it's um, been a, I think it's like plate rolled up aluminum that we use this from. So there's a slight rollover on the, uh, on the front to back edge. It's a saw cut left to right, so that's, that's a very sharp edge, but on this edge just there, and then the one on the other side, it's got probably about a you know half a mil radius on there. So quite a lot of people do this at the moment for probing. They get that far, they hit okay, it makes it there, you know, I'll give it a decent name, so probing X, Y, and then we'll go up to here, to here. So one thing that we now can do is we can look at our actions and we can actually put some logic in here now. So we can do some good an out of position action, a wrong size action. So we'd add some tolerances over at this geometry tab. We had a positional tolerance of a, a millimeter and a size tolerance of a millimeter. So what this is saying is I've got my operator, they're loading in the part into the machine and I want to check they've loaded it roughly in the right place because let's say I've got a clamp on the left hand side that I can't risk hitting so I'm probably going to put you know half a millimeter tolerance on this and then the size now we've had a couple of problems with bar ends being added into the billets you know the people who cut this up for us they just throw in every part and then the last one is normally shorter than it needs to be um, so I need to detect that. So rather than hoping that my operator is going to catch this, I'm actually going to put a size tolerance on here of half a millimeter as well. And then over in my actions tab, I'll actually tick out of position and wrong size. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to run exactly the same probing cycle as normal, but then I'm going to make sure that it's positionally correct within half a millimeter and that the size of that billet in length and width is correct within half a millimeter. So this is something that's really powerful. You know, it's not costing you any extra time on the machine to do this. You don't really need to know the codes behind it. All you need to be able to do is to tick a box. You know, so you imagine how many parts this could potentially save if you've got someone loading the billet slightly incorrect or if you've actually got the wrong size billet on here. So that's quite a big one there is that if you've got the wrong size billet, you know, you've got those bar ends, or even if you've got a, a billet that's too big, you know, we've got our, our passes on here. So if I just go onto the outer roughing pass, you know, this outer roughing pass here is calculated from, <clears throat> sorry, this is calculated from the, the nominal size stock. If our stock's gonna be three millimeters too big, it's not going to know that and put an extra pass in over here. Its first cut's going to be whatever I set to be its initial step over plus that three millimeters. So that's actually quite a big step over now. I'm potentially going to snap my tool. So, you know, so people say they don't like probing. It's a waste of time. It's not very efficient. You've got to think on there 
that you've got to think on here that how much does a tool cost? How much does potentially scrapping that part cost? You start putting those into account and it very, very quickly actually starts to make sense to do this probing. So that's what we've got there. I've done my X and Y, I want to do a Z as well. So I'm going to go on here again, back to probing WCS. I'm going to click that, that top. Now the problem is it's guessed that I'm going to do a rectangle, but I don't, I want to do probing on that Z surface. Now we default to the center of that surface, but I actually want to maybe use that selection point that I made. So I can go over here and use that selection point. So it's just a way of toggling between where you selected or the center of that, 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 that face, that surface. Again, I can put the same things on here. You might notice now that we've only got a positional check, not a size check. Of course, when you only take one point, you can't check its size. You, need, you can only check its position because we don't know, let's say that was down a millimeter. Is it because the actual billet was down a millimeter or is it because the, the, the billet was shorter by a millimeter? We don't know. So we only allow you to check the position here. That's why you can't see the size. We then go onto the actions tab again and I'm gonna turn on out of position action. Yeah, because if I have a quick look on here, let me just drag this, this tool path up to the top. I'm gonna to drag that up to the top there and just call that probing Z. I'll do this just so I sort of know, know what I've got on on the comments. And I look at my outer roughing. You know, I get quite close to my jaws here. So I don't want to risk this being loaded slightly low or even the billet being slightly too short and actually updating my datum so far down that without knowing, I'm now gonna cut the top off my jaws. So that's why in here, I'm gonna make sure that I've probably got, I'm probably gonna go a little bit tighter, 0.3 millimeters, and then tick that out of position action on there as well. So if we have a quick look at this, this roughing pass I've got on here, you know, we've got, that selected contour there, and we've got three millimeters down from that. So, you know, we're gonna be getting quite close to these jaws here. That's probably only about half a millimeter away. So I don't wanna risk updating anything more than half a millimeter. So yeah, that's what we've got on there. That's the little bit really in the probing on that and it's sort of roughly how that works. Um, I would love to be by the machine. That is a virtual background behind me. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big sheet here. Um, that's not actually the, uh, the house in our, our tech center in Birmingham. Thankfully, I have got a, a quick pre-recorded video of what this is actually gonna do on the machine for us. So we can see here that I've got that billet of material in there. I'm gonna probe the X and Y first, and then I'm gonna actually come over now and start to probe the Z after this. So we're gonna do the X. What we try to do inside of Fusion is actually try and make probing a bit more available to the masses. What you wouldn't realize here normally is this is actually running three cycles. This is running a cycle to probe the X. It's then running a separate cycle to probe the Y. It's then running a third cycle to probe the Z. Now you'd have to know all the codes to actually do this, but hopefully inside of Fusion, you know, you can just use this, click on the right tabs, and actually be able to program this without needing to know all those individual commands. I mean, if you really want to, uh, you know, you've got P9832 is to turn the probe on, P9810 is what they call a protected positioning move. You don't want to start knowing those. I mean, I don't want to know them, but unfortunately I do. Um, so what you want to be able to do is do this inside of Fusion and then not have to move across. So I've just got a question here about, um, are all of the green moves, um, does it have any bearing on the delay I spoke about earlier? No, it doesn't. The, the electrical and mechanical delay are normally so small um, that we don't actually change those as we go on. Um, they don't get fed back into fusion, so we don't know about them. Um, they're, they're never really enough to actually cause us a problem. So the calibration data doesn't affect those moves. The eccentricity one will though. So the eccentricity one, it will actually adjust the position ever so slightly in the macro, but it doesn't show it inside of fusion. So 
what you've actually got here for fusion um, is, you know, that will be dead on the center line. But what will actually happen on the machine is the actual end of the probe will be dead on the center line, but the spindle will be out ever so slightly by that eccentricity value. So that's why those green values are where they are, because that's where the probe will go, but not necessarily where the spindle goes, because there's that slight difference, remember, between the spindle center line and the probe center line. So, yeah, so I hope that, that answers your question. Uh, Nick, if not, shout up or, or we can have a chat with it afterwards and we'll go over that again. So that's what we've got on there for sort of Pro WCS. Um, there's one more item on Pro WCS that stumbles a lot of people. And this is called Override Driving WCS. So where that is inside of Fusion is it's on the Actions tab again. So we've got this Actions tab to override the driving WCS. I can click on that and then I can put in, you know, one is G54, two is G55, three is G56. And I can override the datum set here in my setup. So I've got G54 here in my setup. And, you know, I can change this to run off G55, for example, which is number two. So that's really quite useful in some occasions. So what that's going to look like is inside the setup that you've got offset one. Inside override driving WCS, you've got offset two. You've got G55 here, which is going to command the probe. So the probe is going to be commanded in the second coordinate system, so G55. So all those moves, you know, X, Y, zero, X, 100, are going to be in the G55 coordinate system. But S1 here means it's updating G54. And then you can see the milling operation. So top face is my next milling operation. That's going to be then running G54. So the probe moves in G55, but updates G54. So that's something to be careful of there, something to be aware of, but it is really useful. So why is it so useful? We have a quick look here. You know, we've got our datum set up on our machine. So on the left, we haven't got override driving WCS. We've got our datum set up and we make our first part. The datum now shifts to there. We're now gonna make our second part, the datum shifts down. And what's happening is our datum is constantly moving around on our machine bed. And that's really bad practice. Because if you've got a part that you've misloaded incorrectly, you know, it's gonna start actually moving over because you could incrementally move the part half a millimeter each time and you wouldn't notice it. But after 10 parts, you've now moved the part five millimeters. So override driving WCS is a brilliant way to make sure that the datum stays static on the table and that your new part is rel relative to the datum, not that your new part is relative to your last part. This is really useful. You can also sort of hack this into doing multiple datums as well. So you could have like a datum on a corner fixture that's G59 that you never change, but the, the position changes of the part on like the, the table then. And then you can always command the probe in G59 to the right place because you'd have that like modeled up correctly inside of Fusion. You might have like one or two fixture plates on the bed and you just make sure that the G59 never changes in the corner. Uh, that's your setup datum, and then you go from there. So there's a couple of different ways of using it, but it is a really powerful tool. It just allows you to make sure that your datum, again, stays static on that table, and you're not just chasing it around the table all the time, looking for where it's going to be. So, yeah. So we're going to look at probe geometry. Um, any more questions? Anything not clear of what I've said so far? Going too fast, going too slow. Feel free to uh, to shout up as you need. I was gonna say, Richard, I was going to say, that's an excellent uh, slide that you just showed as far as overriding WCS. I mean, I've seen the setting, I've seen you explain it, but like that now that 100% makes sense about why yeah, you would it, do that. Um, yeah. It's actually quite, I, I literally made that, what, an hour before this meeting because I was going to just explain <laughs> it. But I thought I've explained it so many times and I just had that blank look back at me. But we go like, oh, yeah, like, shut up now. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So I thought this actually tries to show that, you know, override driving, driving WCS stops you chasing that data around the table. You know, yeah. as, a, as a machinist, variation is my enemy. 
and this stops variation. You know that every time you're not adjusting your datum that you're probing from, you're just adju adjusting that datum you're milling from then. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. So yeah, yeah, you can start using this now, Rob. Now you're a certified user. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go on to the next topic now, looking at looking at probe geometry. So what I can actually look at doing is going one step further. So again, this is this extension functionality. So this is free at the moment. You've got that extended access until at the moment it's the thirty first of March. In May, that's it. May, I know you said March, but it's definitely May at the moment. It's on that starting slide. Um, but this allows us to actually start probing mid process. We're going to try and catch variation and we're going to then start having actions based upon that. So, this is brilliant for what we call lights out machining. Let's say you starting, you're starting to want to actually make a bit more use of your time. You might have a couple of operators that are off sick at the moment or can't make it into work. Uh, you know, you might have someone trying to run two or three machines. They can't sit there catching everything, you know, but we can hopefully with our probe start to make sure we try and catch any problems that we might start seeing them in the process here. So again, let's jump back into, uh, into Fusion, have a look at what this looks like on the part. So I did actually make this, uh, this Turner's cube. Um, it's quite a nice part. Uh, if you make it right, it actually breaks apart the last second and then you get a cube within a cube within a cube um, and it doesn't go anywhere. They all stay static inside of one another. So it's quite a nice way of, way of doing things. Um, it's quite common. People make this on lathes, hence the reason why it's called a Turner's cube. Uh, but I made it on a milling machine because that's all I had to hand at the time. So we've got loads of tool paths on this part, you know, running over it and cutting it. Um, but there's a big problem with this part. I made it out of resin. A lot of people make them out of wood actually, but it gets so thin on these corners, you get a load of deflection in the part itself. Not necessarily deflection in the tool, but deflection in the part. So we needed to use the probe to actually update the tool wear to compensate for this. So what I've got here is I've actually got a, a semi-finishing pass. Let's have a quick look at some of the parameters I've got inside of that. So one thing I've got on here is I've got a stock to leave of 0.1 millimeters. You know, I've then got a, a roofing pass of half a millimeter, but then I've got a finishing step over here of 0.1. And that's something that's quite key here is that my stock to leave is the same as my finishing step over. And the reason behind this is imagine we're trying to compensate here for deflection. So we're looking at the force all the time. So I've got a, a semi-finishing cut that's going to be, the last cut is going to be a, a 0.1 millimeter step over, and it's going to leave 0.1 millimeters on the part. So you, some of you might have guessed where I'm going on this already. The force of that 0.1 millimeter step over for that last part is of course going to be the same force of when I do my finishing pass and remove that stock to leave. So that's why those two are the same value on this is because I needed to make sure that the step over that I'm going to then probe from is going to be equivalent to the step over that is going to be the next milling path after I update the tool wear. So I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit of a, a weird scenario, um, but it was vital on this part I was making out of resin. And another key thing here is you need to do compensation type. You need to make sure that it's, it's one of the versions of the in control. So in control or where, but definitely not in computer or off. Because of course, we can't start updating tool wear if you're not using tool wear, because then we'll update it and nothing will happen. And then you'll keep making scrap parts and wonder why, even though you've been using your probe. So that's roughly what we've got on, on our settings in our milling pass. So I'm going to go into probe geometry now. I'm going to select, oh, there we go on there. So we've got that probe geometry pass. I'm just going to drop it down to a circular hole because I've got nothing in the center. And what I need to do is I'm actually going to end up going outside here of, of where my part is. So again, back onto my heights tab, I'm just going to lift that up ever so slightly. So one thing to bear in mind here is 
we've got a sphere on our machine. The green line is the bottom of the sphere and the tip of the arrow is hopefully showing us where the contact point is on that bit of the sphere. So if you're ever worried about, is that gonna miss there where that green line is? No, it's not, because that's the bottom of the, the ruby, the bottom of that styly, the sphere. But that arrow there tries to show us where the contact point is. And that's pretty much smack bang in the middle of those two surfaces. Yes, there's not a great deal to probe on there, but I'm gonna do the best job I can, trying to get it smack bang in the middle of those two surfaces. So I'm then gonna go onto my actions tab, like I've done before. I don't want to error if I'm out of position or out of size. I want to update my tool wear. So I'm going to select that one. Now, there's a couple of things that we need to do on here. We need to look at the tool number. We need to look at, is there any stock to leave on there? Because, of course, if you've got like a 50 millimeter hole and you leave one millimeter on that hole, you then probe that. You need to be checking that's 49 millimeters, not 50 millimeters. Because if you were checking it was 50 millimetres, you've left a millimetre on it, you get the picture, it's going to update the tool by a millimetre, and that's going to cause us a big problem. So there's quite a few things actually here that we, we need to do, uh, we need to check. Another one is the tool orientation. So imagine you've got a, a face mill on a 3 plus 2 machine, and you're going to machine the top, you're then going to rotate the part, machine the other side, You've used the tool length in both of those scenarios to machine those two sides. But if you probe the Z in the top, you're going to update the length. If you probe the X surface, you'll update the radius. But we'll cover that in a second. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select my correct tool path. That's my reference tool path. So that is that the tool path that just cut that feature I'm now going to probe. And you can see here that it's grabbing the tool and it's grabbing the stock to leave. So what we're trying to do here again, all what we're trying to do is make probing that bit more accessible. I don't want you to have to sit down with the manual and learn all those different Renishaw commands. You should be able to do it all graphically from here with inside of Fusion. So you choose that reference operation and the reference operation again is the operation that has just cut that, that feature. I'm gonna hit okay. And it's now populated that. So all those bits of information that I was discussing, the tool number, the stock to leave, the orientation, have we turned compensation on? We've checked all that for you. You know, you don't have to worry about that. We're going to do all that checking in the background for you. We've done something called minimum update threshold. Now, probes and machines have got tolerances, as you'd imagine. You know, if you touch a point 50 times, there's going to be an amount of variation you're going to get back in the repeatability. Everything's made to a tolerance. So you don't want to be updating for every single micron. So what I would do here is probably put on, you know, maybe, I don't know, sort of 50 microns. So what I'm going to say is, unless the deviation is more than 50 microns, do not update my tool wear. And again, we talk about like this variation is my worst enemy. This is a brilliant way of stopping that. It stops the tool just chasing all the time, tiny little variations. So what we can do now is we've got a, an error correction as well. Sometimes people know that they don't actually want to update 100% of, of what, they, what they actually find the deviation to be. They only might want to update maybe 80% of this. In my case, I want to update 100%. I want to update everything that I've got on there. So I'm going to hit OK. It's asking me to choose my tool, which I probably should have done first. Getting into bad habits here. Um, and then I'm just going to name that probe geometry tool update. And then I'm going to pop it right there in between the semi-finishing. It's now invalidated it because I've moved its position in the tree. So I'm just going to go control G and generate that tool path again. It takes two seconds. So I've got my semi-finishing pass. I'm then going to probe that and update my tool wear. And then what I need to do then is actually go back and do a, I'll probably do a 2D contour on there and then just, just probe with that. So let's go for it and do that. So I'm going to go milling 2D, 2D contour. I'm going to choose that contour. 
One thing I did quickly check then is I'm actually using the right tool. The tool I've just updated, which is T2. I then want to go down to that selection there. And I don't need to do any more passes. I know there's only 0.1 on that. So I'm going to hit OK. And it's going to chuck a nice toolpath on there for me. But I have forgotten something. I forgot to put compensation on. So that's a big thing that you will tend to forget. You know, unless you're used to programming with compensation on all the time, it's something that's really easy to forget. So the passes, compensation type in control, there's no point updating your toolware if you don't then use it. So toolware is really good. Um, it's a bit underrated really on, on, on how well it can be used. Um, but please, if you are starting to look at, you know, running that bit more lights out machining, trying to you know, hand off some of the, the manual intervention onto your process and make it a bit more automated. This is a perfect way to sort of introduce yourselves into doing that. You start doing toolware updates after machining bores and bosses. So I'm just gonna call that for my benefit, um, top finish pass. Richard, just wanted to jump in for a second. If uh, just thinking of like, as you're talking about having to know all the codes, um, if you had to write this, I mean, normally in the, in the past before doing it out of fusion in the past, if you had to do this, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you'd have to write the logic statements to right to basically yeah. say, if it's out of this tolerance, then you'd have to set some logic in there to trigger the update of the, of the, uh, to yeah, wear, right? yeah, no, brilliant shout. So let's let's actually let's look at what the code looks like for this now. You know, we're, we're going a bit we're going a bit off topic, but why not? It's all it's all all part and parcel of what we're trying to do here. So I'm just going to choose the right post processor here. Um, sit, hit post. Let's see, this is normally when demos go wrong. Is when uh, yeah. it's when yeah. you completely <laughs> get off topic. But oh well. So it's look, Wednesday. So got, let's let's throw a curve. Yeah. Oh well. But yeah, anyone, please look. I know Rob's asking me to do this, but if you've got any questions about what I'm doing, just, just shout up and we'll go through them together. You know, we're hopefully all friends here. Um, so you're going to need to know that you're going to turn your probe on, which is G65 P9832. You're then going to do a linear protected positioning move, which is a bit of a mouthful, but that's what Reddish will call it, which is P9810. So that's a linear move where the probe will stop if it contacts anything. You're then gonna do another protected positioning move. So that was down to the clearance height, that's now down to the retract height. Now you need to know that P9814 is a bore measuring cycle. You need to know that the diameter was not 80 millimeters because you left 0.1 on a side, so you left point you get the picture. You look at all these things you need to know to hand write out this code. You need to do a toolware update, you know, and you need to put that, um, what was it called again, that minimum update threshold. Yeah, there's so much on here that you need to actually know um, to get this to work. And then you, know, you need to retract out the hole, you need to turn the probe off. We're trying to stop you having to know all this because it's not fun. No one wants to know all this. Um, but hopefully, you know, you get the picture inside of Fusion. You don't need to know what all those codes are. You know, I've gone in here, I've made my tool path, and I've selected my operation. And I can do that. I don't need to know pages and pages scouring through manuals trying to find the right commands. I can qu quite easily, you know, either watch a brilliant webinar like this or look at the tool tips or look at the help and work out what I'm trying to do from this. So that's what we've got on the probe results. Um, that's doing the, the diameter of the tool. But then another thing here is I potentially need to do the length of my tool as well. So let's do that. So we're going to go in setup. We go pro WCS, set that there. We see that it defaults to the center, which is not good in this scenario. So I want to use my selection point. And that then that's my selection point there. And sorry, I didn't do, I'm doing pro WCS now. I need to do pro geometry. So it needs to be pro geometry that I'm doing, not WCS. Surely someone spotted that and should have shouted me out on it. So use the selection point for Pro WCS. I'm probing a Z surface. Again, like we talked about, let's get these approach and over travels down. You know, I don't want to start wasting loads and loads of time doing this. Then on the, uh, on the actions, I'm here now. I'm just going to go update tool where, choose that operation again. 
and it's going to choose axial stock to leave now rather than radial stock to leave. So again, some of that's going to easily trip you up if you're having to hang rock like this. Um, yes, yeah, so the question at the moment is how deflection is going to be confused with tool wear. You can't separate the two. So I know at the moment that I'm actually doing deflection rather than tool wear. But you know, the control has only got one way I can update this, and that is via deflection. Um, so so via tool wear. So even though I'm actually updating deflection in this case, um, the tool wear is the tool I'm using to do it with, or, or the function, I should say, not the tool. The tool for tool wear, that's a bit of a weird phrase. So yeah, the tool wear is the function that I'm using here to compensate for deflection. So that's, that is the only way I can do it on this part. You know, hopefully if you've got different parts, you can use it in different ways. So we're just trying to show how, how versatile this, this can be. So it's got the, the axial stock to leave. Again, minimum update threshold, set that to 50 microns, hit OK, and pop that in the right place. So there we go. Let's not update everything. Let's just update just the one. And then when I come to do that contour pass, you know, potentially I might do two contours because I'd probably get a weird line there now. Um, you know, if I'm updating my tool length, I've got an axial offset on there. So I should probably, you know, put a put a roughing pass on that. Probably a step over what it's an eight mil tool, so let's go four millimeters and let's go for two step overs on there. So there we go. So it's gonna do two step overs. It's then gonna come in and do the, the last one there, that last pass that you see, um, with the tool compensation applied to finish off that wall. So hopefully on here now I've probed. The, the tool radius, I've probed and compensated for the, the tool length, and then I've done my finishing pass, which has just taken off that bottom surface at the right amount, and also that wall at the right amount. So I mean, you can see there, let me just measure this, how, how small this gap is. And here, so, you know, so it's linear, that's only two millimeters. So you don't really need a lot of deviation on there to really start, you know, that's on three faces, that is. Uh, and it's not just the three faces, because if you cut this too low or you cut that diameter too wide, you potentially break the part open as well. So as soon as you start doing two millimeters divided by six, you don't need a lot of deviation to accumulate to actually get rid of that little mounting corner um, that you see there as well. So that's why on a part like this, it was so, so vital really to end up doing that. So that's what we've got there. As, as, as probe, probe geometry to update the tool wear. So any, any more questions before I, uh, I go on to inspect surface? I think we're all good. Again, we can have a big, big end of this, um, an open Q and A. So if you don't want to shout up now or, or anything, just feel free to wait to the end and we're gonna have a, an open Q and A at the end as well, as we go on there. Right, again, bit similar to uh, the, the probe WCS. I'd love to be able to show you this on the machine, but I can't. Um, so this is what it actually looked like when I did it a couple of weeks ago in preparation for all of this. So you go and see, I've, I've machined that out and then I can actually go on and it all breaks apart as I'd hope it would then on that final finishing pass. So it's quite a nice part when it's all finished. Um, I say if anyone has got a bit of time at the moment and wants to try it, it's, a, it's quite a nice part to actually try and machine. Richard, I, I do have a question I figured I'd ask. Um, in your experience and in your past life, how much would you have used this functionality? Like, is it something you would do if you're doing a large part run? Would you do it after a certain amount of parts? Would you do it at every part? Would, you know, what would you be your experience of when you would apply something like this? It's, it's one of those, it's a little bit tricky because it, you know, every part's different. Um, what, what I would do again, I, I hello, studio. Oh, hello. Hold on. Someone unmuted accidentally. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, I come from a background in quality. So what I would actually be doing here is I'd want to collect some, some data on, you know, I'd look at a hundred parts and I'd look at, you know, how, how far, how, how far is that process of 100 parts does my tool start to wear? 
and then I'd work out, do I need to do it every part? Do I need to do it every 20 parts? At what point do I need to do it then? I wouldn't just go in blind and say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to every part I'll probably update my toolware. You know, this is a, a case of, this is production run stuff. You know, yes, you can do it for a one-off part. This was a one-off. But again, this is a bit of a special case scenario where I had a lot of deflection happening. Um, but, you know, you've got to look at your part, think of what you need, and start looking at the deviation over time and actually try and eradicate that with the tool wear as well. On that. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense, yep. Rob. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's a case-by-case -case basis, really. Yeah, it, re it really is. Again, you, 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 it's, it's a brilliant tool that you can tailor to do whatever you want to use it for. You know, if you, if you don't want to use it for making Turner's cubes, you can do whatever you want to use it. I'm not saying this is the, the only example or the best example. Uh, it's just quite a nice one that, that meant I got a nice puzzle at the end of it, really. Right. I can imagine one of those, you know, those tricky geometry parts or tricky materials that uh, it's going to, like, you will experience deflection like this. So that's, this is a handy tool to have, you know, so because you can't scrap that one part. You just, yeah, exactly. You know, you one. I can't make one to then find out I need to put my tool wear on it. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, another, another thing on here, it's really difficult to measure because you try and measure it with a vernier. Uh, so you measure it with a set of calipers and you actually bend the part when you're measuring it because you're putting manual pressure on. But the probes have got such low trigger force, they'll probably give you a better result than what a micrometer or a set of uh, verniers will. Um, but yeah, one, one thing on this part though, um, or on sort of any, any part is, let's say you've got 30 holes on a part. One thing I used to do is only ever probe the last one. Because at the end of the day, you know, the chances are that you're gonna, you, you wanna machine them all. I would then probe the last one ready for the next part. So that's if I'm doing serial production, I'll probe the last one. If I'm doing a one-off, I'd of course probe the first one. So the sort of the way you attack this really does depend on, you know, production wise and the part you've got. So if I've got sort of 20 holes in a base plate and it's a one-off base plate, I'll machine that first one with a bit of stop to leave, you know, look at, am I getting any deflection from the tool from a long overhang? I'm gonna update that, then I'm gonna run on. Whereas if I'm actually going to do this as a serial production run, I tend to update my tool at the end of the part because then it's going to update it for the next part. So the way I think of that personally is I'm starting afresh on the next part I do then. That's just the way I do it. And that means you haven't got to do this whole, allow a bit of stock to leave, then probe it, then machine it again. You know, if you just do it on the last part and keep going on a big production run, it just works out a little bit easier sometimes. But I'm not saying that you need to do it that way. Just trying to give examples of, uh, of how I've done it in the past. So yeah, that's what we've got on there. So we're going to now take a quick look at what we call non-prismatic inspection or, or freeform inspection. So basically, we're now going to go away from the CAM cycles and actually go into some, some quite... I don't want to say quite complex G-code, um, but we're actually going to be like long writing this G-code out in the post-processor. So we'll go over that and what it means. So don't be daunted by it when we first look at it. Um, but this is, again, really useful. I'm never saying this is going to replace a CMM. CMMs are brilliant. I spent most of my, my life working with CMMs. But this certainly is going to alleviate a lot of the pressure on CMMs and also give a bit of onus back to the machinist. You know, me as a machinist, I don't want to be making my own part and then having to take it off the machine, give it to my inspector, wait an hour for the results to come back to find out that it was wrong. And I've got to then try and spend two hours dataming it back on the machine to do some, you know, modifying work of a fillet or something. You know, I want to be able to have a good idea that the part I'm making is correct. You know, I want to be in control of my own quality as a machinist. And this is what we're effectively allowing you to do. What a lot of people say is, you know, how can you trust the machine to make its own work, to, to check its own work? Well, why do you trust the CMM to check it? Well, because you get the CMM calibrated. We're not suggesting that you start paying to get your machines calibrated in the same way, but you can use your CMM to cross check your machine. So you can make a test piece on your machine then you can check that on your CMM and you can check that the results match up fairly accurately. You then have a good confidence that you can start to use your machine to do some in-process checking of its own work. Again, 
Not saying that machine tool probing is going to replace CMMs, but it is really good. It starts working with them, alleviates the pressure on the CMMs, and gives the machinist the chance to be in control of his own quality. So inspect surface is the tool path we use for this. And it runs a little bit differently to a can cycle. So you've got fusion on the left. You select the points you want to inspect. You create NC code like any other, and you run that on the machine tool. The big difference now is the machine tool makes a results file that then you take back into fusion and import. So there's now this two way street of data, us giving the machine data and the machine giving us data. And that's quite a big step. So starting to get your head round, you're no longer executing programs on the machine. Your machine is actually making a program now. It's making its own files. It's quite cool, really. <laughs> so it's making its own files, going to give you that, so you can put that back into Fusion. And you can see on the right image there, we then get a graphical display of each point. You know, we've got that's called cylinder confetti, where it's a cylinder. The cylinder is proportional to the deviation. We've then got a table, but let's have a, a big look at that now. So, yeah, that's what we've got in there. So here we've got a steering wheel mold. This was a, a cam sample that we did, did last year. So hopefully some of you might, might recognize this uh, from some videos that we've done. This was actually taken from a, a carbon fiber layup that we looked at. So again, on the probing tab, we've got inspect surface. Once again, this was normally uh, part of the manufacturing extension capability, but as part of the extended access program, you've got access to this as well. So inspect surface is lovely to demo because what you get to is you get to place a point on the part and then you get to drag that wherever you like. I mean, I'm sorry, if you don't like the look of that motion, then you're on the wrong call. Um, so what you get to do is you get to put that anywhere you like on the path, and it's going to probe exactly that point. Now, why is it so important that we do that motion? What you can see here is the tool tracking what we call the surface normal of that point. So that point there, what is the, the perpendicular direction exactly from that point? And this stops something called skidding. If you come just down in Z on like an 80 degree surface, your probe is going to skid down that surface a bit before it triggers. Again, if I had a machine, I'd be using a machine, not my hands, but you get the point. So what we've got here is you can see that as we actually track this point around, the blue line, which is the, the line the tip of the probe will take, is actually going to reflect that surface as we go around. So let's pop some points on here. Have a look as we go. Oh, I didn't mean to put two points there. Um, so I can hold shift and select a point and it'll get rid of the point. So you can quite happily do that on here as well. I'll put a point on there, get one there and one there. I'm just going to pop one on each of those faces just to prove that those faces have been machined correctly. So that's what we've got here. So we've got a load of points on that face. Again, you would look and choose where you need these points. The same sort of things apply. But then we've got something called surface offset here. Surface offset's really good um, if you're measuring parts that maybe have got a coating on them. So let's say you know, you're measuring that part and a portion of it's been painted or it's before paint and you need to put a negative surface offset. So if it's been painted, um, and you're saying there's like an extra positive amount of material on there, you can put that on and it will subtract that off globally on those parts as it comes on. Again, we've got now an upper tolerance and a lower tolerance. So how far am I happy for it to be with intolerance positive and how far am I happy to be with intolerance negative? I'm not gonna start adjusting those because pretty obvious what they do really. And then again, the same approach in over travel as before. I'm happy with to leave those at four. That's what we've got on there. Again, heights on here, very similar. We've just got this retract height here. So if I move the camera slightly, you'll see there that that goes up and takes them all up. Again, I want to be really nice and efficient. So I'm going to drag that down to there. One thing you've got to make sure 
is you don't drag this below the approach point. So I've got a point on the top of this surface here, and I know that we're going to be four millimeters up from that surface. I've got to make sure that I don't drag this below that. Because if we do, you're going to get a really weird move on the machine. It's going to come down, then back up, then back down again. We do error out if you do that and tell you that you've put your retract height too low. But it's just something to bear in mind. If you see a warning saying the retract height set too low, it's because of that. Uh, the main reason that is for safety. We don't want to be plunging the probe down at a rapid feed rate to then retract back up and then do the slow probing feed rate. So that's my heights on there. One thing on here is the measure feed rate, which I'd like to say about. So if we just try and remember back, I know it was an hour ago now uh, when I started talking, you're all thinking, is he going to stop talking anytime soon? But no, I'm not. Um, is we talked all about this calibration and what does calibration mean and why do we need it? And it's about that electrical and mechanical delay. So if you're running at a certain feed rate when you calibrate, you need to make sure that you're running at that feed rate when you're probing. And that's really important or else there's no point calibrating if you're running at a different feed rate. If you don't know what this feed rate is, there's a really easy way to find out. Just run any probing sequence on the machine, keep an eye on the active feed rate and just watch what it is when it touches. There's two types of probing, one touch and two touch. One touch will touch the part once as the name suggests. Two, two touch will touch the part twice, as the name suggests. It will touch once very quickly, and then a second a little bit slower. I'm not going to get into the merits of one touch versus two touch on this call. We'd be talking here forever, all of that. But it's just something you need to be aware of, that there's the potential of having a two touch process. And don't take the first touch, take the second touch, which is the slower feed rate. So you want to have a look at your machine. Make sure you've got the slower feed rate. Haas defaults to 102 millimeters a minute um, for their two touch Renishaw cycles. I'm just going to hit OK on that now. That's going to make my inspection path. Again, select my probe and carry on from there. So that's effectively what's going to happen on the part. Now, I would love to run this on the machine. I can't. Um, we do actually have a little cheap post processor that creates that results file for us. Um, so I want to do that for you now. So I'm going to create an NC program. I've got this, uh, this post processor saved. Again, when, uh, when we send you out the feedback form, uh, the feedback form, sorry, the follow-up email to this, if anyone is interested in this results generator, just send us an email back or ask for it on the manufacturer forum and I'll, I'll happily give it out to anyone who wants it. Um, I'm going to put a random number generation value in there of 0.13. Uh, my tolerance was 0.1, so 0.13. I'm hopefully going to get some points that are out of tolerance on that. Just going to hit post. And you're going to now see what a results file looks like. So this is a results file. Looks quite daunting, but don't worry. It's really quite simple. We always start with a start and end with an end. That's so when we import the results file, we can know where the results lie between. Because some machines don't erase the file. They're what they call append to it. So what they do is you run it once. If you don't delete the file, you'll get that again. So you'll get it twice. And we just need to work out what was the last time you ran it. If we spot this, we'll, we'll warn you and say we've found multiple starts and we're going to take from the last start onwards. So if you see an error saying there's multiple starts, we're going to take from the last start onwards. This is effectively what it means. You've had an appended results file going down. Or another way of doing it is maybe you had a problem on the machine. So let's say you ran that much of the code, and then it stopped. You had an error, you had a false trigger, you, you had a problem, the machine, the air went down. What you're going to happen now is have half a results file and then a full results file. So again, we'll just warn you that there's multiple starts. But these are just all things to have a look at um, to make sure you don't have any problems when you're doing this. The next one is the document ID and model ID. Now, there's, we had two concerns when we implemented this functionality. The first one being was you try and import the results file into the wrong document. 
the document ID tries to stop that. And the next one is you could make a huge CAD change, save the file, and then we would try and bring those results back in and they'd be importing into the wrong CAD. So that's the model version. And then we've just got the toolpath ID and the toolpath name so we can link it all up. And all the rest then really is, is information about each inspection point. But I'm not getting into that, so please don't worry about it. I'm just trying to give you an overview of this file because I'm sure some of you will open it and have a look at it and you just want to roughly know what it means. Like the G800 line there is where should you have touched. The G801 is where you did touch. So this is just all what the machine is giving back to Fusion, saying you should touch here and you did touch there. So let me just copy this file path. And then in Fusion here, I'm going to go Actions, Import Inspection Results, paste that in. And you can see on here now I'm starting to get my results back. So really nice, giving us some results across the part, everywhere I selected. Got this nice confetti. There's three confetti options. So what we need to do on here is go on Preferences. I'm just going to load up my Preferences tab. We're just going to do Preview Features. Sorry, not Preview Features. We're going to go Manufacture. And then we've got cylinder, confetti, or pin. So confetti is a flat disc, but this is, has a problem where it gets lost in concave surfaces. So my personal preference is to use cylinders, but then cylinders can be a problem for some people if they're too big. So we've got something called pins, which just to show you that one there is you've got a pin. That just puts, a, again, a pin on there. The size of the pin is a scale of how far out the point is. But just to show you, if you're wondering why mine might look different to yours, you can just go on general manufacture and then change this here to cylinder. That's my personal preference. But you can't just leave it there. I want to actually look at the values of this. So we've now got this node that's appeared down here called results. And I want to show these results. And it brings up now an interactive table where I can actually click on results and it highlights that in this table for me. And it works both ways. So I can click on a result here and it's going to highlight it on the CAD for me. So I can click on that one. Of course, it's going to highlight the only blue one for me on there. So really nice bit of functionality to be able to provide a graphical report and result. Um, and then it's going to hopefully show then what's going on and we're going to be able to give a nice report to our customers to show what's going on there. So Richard, could I, could I chime in and ask a question? And then, <laughs> all right. So I was, I'm thinking, you know, out loud because I, I know it's awesome technology that you know, we actually poured it off from power inspect. Um, but I imagine like, I know this was a randomized, uh, you know, post that just kind of put, put the little bit of deviation in there, but I'm thinking, yeah. what would you expect typically to see something like, would you see, uh, on a part like this and some of the points were maybe more weighted on one side or the other and knowing that, you know, like maybe we, maybe the part wasn't centered correctly and maybe we need to adjust the, off, just the work offset, you know, like what would you typically do if you were yeah. get, get some feedback and what to do from there, you know? Exactly. What I'd expect to see here is like a trend, you know, unfortunately I can't say all the points on that A make them slightly too small. So what you might find there is like the tool length for this was set too low. So the whole of that A was actually negative and go down. So you'd see a problem there. You know, you might see if I probe on this surface here, you get extra material where you had more deflection on a finishing tool, for example. Let's say you had to change down to like a small two mil ball nose and you're going over that surface, you get deflection on it. You're not going to be machining as much away. So you might find on these parts here, that you actually get a, an amount of deflection. So you'll get trends. One thing that I've seen in the past is all the left side are blue, the middle is green, the right side is red. That's actually where the part has shifted for some unknown reason, you know. Let's say you had a problem at the end and you've actually had a bit of a, a, a heavy cut and the parts move slightly in the vise after a previous cut had happened. I've seen that in the past quite a lot. Happens more than you think. Um, yeah, I'd, I wouldn't expect to see a complete randomized error. You normally look for like trends of what's going on there. But yeah, unfortunately, I can't run this on the machine, but we still want to deliver this uh, this content to all you guys listening in. 
Definitely. I just figured I'd try to walk people through what, what they would, what this would look like if they were doing in, in, you know, in the field and then what they would do with the results like that. But yeah, it's, this would be tough, like to take this thing off, go inspect it and realize it's, it's off and have to go try to align it back in and, and machine. You know, yeah. Imagine if I hadn't got these datum holes, um, right. I had to like resurface that out. It would be an absolute nightmare to put this back on the machine and redatum it all for that. Cause what a lot of people don't sort of realize with mold tools is, you don't care really about these holes. You care about the impression. The, the, the impression is the bit you sell. You don't sell the datum holes at the back. So if you're doing rework on a mold or die tool, it's more important to reference the, the inner faces than what it is to actually reference the datum faces. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. You're, you're a good psychic, Rob. Appreciate it. Um, one thing I definitely don't want to gloss over is you can do this in three plus two. So I can choose a tall orientation on that face and I can then start putting some points inside this slot. Okay, I'm not gonna bore everyone uh, with doing that again, but you get the whole point. The exact same as you do a three plus two milling path, you can do a three plus two probing path. Don't let anyone tell you you can do five axis probing, you can't. You can do three plus two probing, but not simultaneous five axis probing. So yeah, big difference there if you don't know. Three plus two is where you do not move the rotaries at the same time as the three linear axes. So you can move the two rotary axes. So that's the plus two. And then the three is the three linear axes. Full five axes is where the three linear and the two rotary axes all move simultaneously at the same time. So yeah, that's a little bit about that and, and sort of why that works. Again, let's uh, have a quick look in here about part alignment now. So this is, this is quite a nice one. I'm sort of ending on a bang here. Um, we just talked about loading a mold tool back on the machine for extra work. This was a part I did. Uh, I had to make 87 of these uh, and put the Autodesk logo on them. So I 3D printed some soft jaws to hold these parts that I've made. So I made them on our, our deuce and lathe, and then I actually cut these slots out on our hearts, sent them off to be anodized, and then I needed to engrave them after anodizing. If any of you ever want to make a part look really cool, get it anodized first, then machine it afterwards, and it looks absolutely perfect. So that's what we've got on there. Um, so I've got one question, can I use these cylinders? So no, we can't unfortunately at the moment um, do this um, deviation back from the can cycle stuff. So the can cycle stuff generates a results file, which I'll show you later. Um, but you, at the moment, you can't import that back into Fusion. So that just sits as a text file that you can reference. Um, I'd love to be able to import it back in, but we can't do that at the moment, unfortunately. So you can just do this with the inspect surface. So sorry, the answer's no, but I'd much rather give you a straight and correct answer than trying to uh, waffle around it. Um, so we've got our trace tool path here, uh, just taking a, a 0.1 millimeter depth of cut and a one millimeter ball nose. So again, really fragile tool. I've got to be really careful about the amount I'm cutting on here. The problem I've got is these are 3D printed soft jaws. So I can't actually bolt them down to the, the jaws of the vise, you know, as tight as I'd want them to be, because it would just pull straight through the plastic. Um, so there is going to be a little bit of deviation on sort of rocking on the part there. Um, but we can use part alignment to actually solve this. So what I'm going to do, part alignment, again, is extension functionality, but you've all got it at the moment, so please use it. I'm going to go to probing and go to part alignment. So I've got this folder active here. I've now got a couple of different types of part alignment. So I've got three, four, and five axis. So I don't want to discriminate anyone who's not got a five axis machine. I certainly haven't. I've got a little three axis machine in my garage. Um, so if you've only got a three axis machine, then we'll allow you to do an alignment in three axes. Hey, if you've only got a two axis machine, let's say you've got a, a laser cutter with a probe on it, which I've never seen, but let's say you have, um, you can align in just the X and Y. You get the point. You can actually turn off axes and align just in one direction. You might only want to align in the Z. Let's say you've got really good X and Y location on your machine, 
but really poor Z location because of the nature of the part, you could fix the X and Y and just the line about the Z, in which case the algorithm will only calculate a transformation about the Z. We can do four axis. So we can do about, about Z if you've got a turntable, if you've got a fourth axis on the machine, you get the point. Or the full five axis, which is what I'm going to show now because it gives us the best alignment. Again, the more degrees of freedom we have, the better the alignment will calculate. So we'll talk a bit more about degrees of freedom in a second. So I've now actually entered a mode called the part alignment mode. So you can see I've only got these options here. And the reason why we've done this is to try and make it a bit of a walkthrough. You know, Fusion loves working from left to right. So I've just done my edit alignment. I'm now going to go to inspect surface. I'm going to click on inspect surface. Again, select my tool. Remembering the bad habits there of not selecting my tool all the time. And go to geometry and start placing some points on this part. Now, I'm not just placing the points completely randomly across the surface. I'm trying to place points to actually restrict what we refer to as the six degrees of freedom. So that's translation in X, Y, and Z, and rotation in X, Y, and Z. So that, those are our six degrees of freedom we have. So if I placed loads of points just all the way along the top here, so tell you what, let's do that. Let's place loads of points along here, along the top. I'm going to get brilliant location in Z, but really bad location in X and Y. I could place points here, there, and there. And again, I could put them on the other side, there and there. I'm now going to get brilliant location in the Y, but really bad location in the Z and X. So you get the point. We're going to try and distribute those points really nice and evenly across the part to get it. This is a really bad part for X location, so locating the part that way. All I've really got to do is on this radius here, I can place some points on there. So you imagine if the part was too far that way, these ones will be positive. And if it was too far that way, these points will end up being negative. So let's just go back and let's place these points on. Again, you can be a little bit loose putting these parts, these points on, and then you can drag them around after. Yeah, I just want to make sure I don't hit any of the lettering here. Let's put three on there and three on there. So I've got a nice spread of points. I've got 19 points. It's not a huge amount of points. But I've just got 19 points on there. It's going to go and going to probe those. Again, approach and over travel. How far out do you think the part's going to be? Add that safety margin. I hope my part's not more than two mil out. So again, I'm going to stick with four. You might realize I like for as approach and over travel. I've been doing this for quite a while now and I found those to be a nice, nice figure for not wasting too much time, um, but still being quite close to the part. Again, my heights, just check everything looks okay on there. And then, yeah, so again, we've got that blue move there. I don't want to be below that blue move that we see just there. I want to be just above that. So again, eight millimeters above is going to be absolutely fine on that. And hit okay. So it's now made an inspect toolpath inside of this part alignment folder. Notice the big X on there as well means the alignment's not been calculated yet. So we've done the stage one. We've done the stage two to put the results on. We're now going to do stage three. We're going to post for alignment. So what this does is it kicks up an NC program for us. NC programs for any of you that haven't used it before. It's a little bit like it in the post processor button, but it gives you this operations tab where you can actually start to play around with what actually gets posted a bit more. But again, just YouTube or Google Fusion 360 NC programs. I'm not going to go into that for this webinar. Um, I've got enough content as it is. I'm trying to squash it. So you can see here that it, it knows it only needs to output this inspection path. So it's going to output this inspection path here. So I'm going to run that on our machine. i will actually post this and show you what the inspection code actually looks like, just so you don't get worried the first time you see it. 
Again, don't worry. You don't need to understand the code. Um, but I know a lot of people just tend to come back to me and go, oh, what does this mean? How does that mean? So a couple of the post properties, there's something called commissioning mode. What that means is for the very first time you run that, we've actually put a couple of uh, comments in the code that stop the machine and go, hey, has the probe activated? Because it should have done. We say the, the, the probe is about to make contact with the part. Just, just be aware that it's about to make contact with the part. So all, all that is a couple of helpful tips on there. You've got to make sure that, you know, that eccentricity we spoke about, we do fill these in with standard machine defaults. Um, but if you've got problems, the first thing I would check is that, that these are correct. Again, the probe on and off commands, we are 99.9% .9 sure that for every house out there, that's going to be the correct probe on and off command. We do the same for other machine vendors as well. But it's always a good place to look if you're having problems. I then have to turn the axes on. So on the, the VF2 YSS, we've got a, an R tech center with a trunnion on. The A axis is reversed and the C axis is a yes. Um, and one thing, inspection, you have to turn the sequence numbers off. Uh, simply, it can't do the thing called the deprint, which is how it makes the results file with a sequence number on. That's just how it is. So I'm gonna post process this. And I'll have a quick look at the file that brings out now. So again, suddenly looks a bit daunting for anyone that uh, likes to know what their NC code is doing. So a really quick lesson. The dprint is the function that makes the results file. It's saying print the word results file space ADSK underscore engram underscore results. Dprint start. So we all know where we've seen start before in that results file there. That's all that's happening here. We then come down to the moves. So the G31 moves are a little bit different because what you normally have with a G1 is you just have G1 and then you have the X, Y, and Z values. But remember back to what I said about the calibration, we need to take that into account. So that's all we're doing here. Again, it's really simple. I want to go to 109, but bear in mind the eccentricity of X, which is that value there, that, that parameter. So make macro variable two, 109 minus the eccentricity make macro variable three, the Y value minus the eccentricity, make macro variable four, the Z value minus the tool length. And then all we do is we go G31 and rather than going X 109, we just do X macro variable two, which is X that line effectively. So it is, it's really easy. It's just splitting it up into these little calculations because we need to take that, we need to take that, that eccentricity into account. So when you normally run your Rennish or CAN cycles, it's doing all of this, but you just don't see it happening because it runs so quickly. But we just want to make sure that all of you out there listening are aware of this and sort of roughly know what it is. Because I know a lot of people don't want to run NC code. They don't know what it's doing. So hopefully that's going to just explain to you all a little bit more about what the code's actually doing in the lines there. Okay, so that's what happens with the NC code. So I've run that on my machine. It's now given me my results file back. So I would say a bit of a Blue Peter moment, but there's probably not enough people. I think Phil said he was from the UK, but a famous British TV show where they went, here's one I made earlier, and then they bought out something they'd made earlier. So I've done stage one, I've done stage two, I've done stage three, time for stage four to import my inspection results. Select them from your computer. I've got them saved on my desktop here under a very clever named files folder. Part alignment results. I've got a problem. It's warning me that my model version no longer matches my results file. Now I've made it do that so you guys can see the warnings. It will always let you, <laughs> Phil saying he understands my Blue Peter moment now. I've got someone on the call who understands me. Um, so, I can still import those results. We will never stop you importing the results, but we're just gonna hopefully try and prompt you into saying, look, there might be a problem here. You know, someone could have drastically changed the CAD and then you don't wanna be importing those results in because they won't match up with the part properly. So if you know of a big problem 
all you need to do is just repost the NC code, run it back on the machine again. And when you've reposted, it will re-put the new model version in the results file. So that's just something to bear in mind of. Let's say you, you, you run a part, you run five parts a day and you have done for the past year and it's always been importing correctly. Someone suddenly saves a CAD change. It's going to update the model ID and then we're going to say, oh, there's been a change here. So it's a safety mechanism in just to warn you of a change. But again, we're not going to stop you importing the results. So I've got the results here and they look very, very good, but they weren't this good before the alignment takes place. So we automatically apply the alignment. So we've got two ways of viewing this. The one is a, a graph. So it's quite an interesting graph. You've got two axes across the bottom is deviation before the alignment. So that point there, for example, if I click it, it was that point there. Before the alignment, that was positive 2.47 millimeters. Now bear in mind my cut is only 0.1. This is 0.2, that's an extra 247% extra on my cut, which is gonna snap my tool. After the alignment, that's actually been brought back to dead on zero. And now look at the other extreme. And before that was negative 0.136. And then after the alignment, it's actually negative 0.002. Again, I've got a cut of 0.1. If, if my cut's 0.1 and this is negative 0.136, it's actually now the part is lower than my tool bar. So it's not going to cut. So what I like to do with this is think about sort of a bounding box around all these results. So it's basically saying that the deviation before was this much. You see my appalling freehand drawing skills now, you know, and that was negative one five to positive two five. So I've got what 300 microns of deviation there. This is now my deviation after. And again, the worst point and the best point. Let's have a quick look at those. Again, I've just lost that. Let's clear all the annotations off. To the worst point to the best points, I've got after is 15 microns, and that's now negative 17. So I've got what? 30, 33 microns of deviation now rather than 300 microns of deviation. So that's one way of viewing it as like a, an overall executive summary. You can look at all the results plotted on a graph. If you see a square, you've got a big problem because the results after the alignment are just as bad as the results before the alignment. But what I can do here is actually look at it a different way. This is the way that some people prefer is look at the old table, but then toggle the results before and after. So I'm hoping that if all of you weren't muted, I'd have a few gasps of amazement there in, in how cool that looks. But what it's effectively showing is those are the results before the alignment. So if I sort these as far as deviation goes, that was the worst point. That was the other worst point in the other direction. And those were the other points we had there. And then after the alignment, it's now twisted the part and moved the part to put it in a new location. If we look back at that graph, we do actually see that here at the top. So we see that it's had to move it by 0.2 in X, 0.7 in Y, nearly a millimeter in Z, it's had to move the part, and it's had to rotate the part as well. So now we've got the results and we understand the results, we need to output our trace toolpath. So again, all I do now, I've done stage one, two, three, four. Stage five is post with alignment. So again, it makes a new NC program. It knows that it doesn't matter about all these other operations. It's just going to be that trace operation there. It's going to output that with this part alignment active. So if I just quickly choose the right post processor here. So I'm just going to go to my folder. Where I keep my posts in. So we've got there. 
make sure I've got the rotary axis selected or else it's going to moan at me. So reversed and yes. Hit post. So this is, this is a three axis toolpath. It's not got any tool orientation in, but I've now suddenly got an A and a C move. That's because it's doing that translation and rotation needed to put the part in its true new location. So that's what's going on there. Again, there's a big long tutorial I've done on this um, or shout out on the forums, I'll answer. I'm on there far more than I should. Um, so yeah, you're not gonna hopefully know this off by heart from this. I'd love it if you did, but I understand that it's a, a bit of a big concept to try and take in, uh, but hopefully you understand the principles of it. But the very last thing is to show a little bit of reporting now. And then I can go and stop talking for a little bit and let Miles take over. So I've got my part here. And I want to sort of get a nice view of this part to show my customer. So I'm going to put that in the screen, make sure it's nice and big. I'm going to right click and go save inspection report. I can now just give it a quick name. Test one report. You can either save it to Fusion Team or save it to your computer. I'm just going to go desktop at the moment. Hit save. It's now going to take that snapshot, put it in the top of a report, and then give me a really nice table with everything in. So you've now, from your machine, got an inspection report that you can either give to your customer, that you can put in your own records, you can do whatever you want to do with. Really powerful, brilliant bit of tech. It's free at the moment. You've got no excuse not to be trying this. Another quick thing, if you've got your own um, tables and formats you need to use, you can copy and paste this into Excel as well. So you can right click, um, you can copy, you can select all if you want, say dragging, copy and then paste that into an Excel report. If you've got your own inspection report that you guys use in your company, that's not a problem. We allow you to do that as well. So that's hopefully enough of that and what we've hopefully shown, shown there really. So inspect surface is a bit different, but it is really powerful. It, it does a little bit turn your machine into a CMM. So yeah, when we give you the follow-up email to this uh, webinar, um, we'll give you the link to, to four tutorial videos. You might notice the, uh, the rather handsome looking guy there in the top right. Um, so basically this hopefully just goes through what I've gone through today, um, but a bit more step-by-step, -step, a bit more detail in some cases showing you a lot more about the settings you need to do on the machine to set this up and what you need to do on there. So that's pretty much what I've got. One question I have had come through is about the Renishaw result. So I'm just going to quickly show you that. So if I go back onto this bottle opener demo here, um, I'm going to edit here and go actions, print results. And what this is going to do is make the Renishaw results file. So it's a bit different to the Fusion results file in that you can't import it, but it is human readable. So if I just go into my text editor, here's one I made earlier. Um, so we've got component number 77, feature one, two, three, four, five. So you can see there I had this example, I had a diameter 25 millimeter hole, I had four of them, and then I had a, just a Z probe coming straight down. So what we've got there is component 77, feature one, two, three, four, five. I then increment to component 78, one, two, three, four, five. Component 79, you get the picture. And that happens by ticking this little increment component here. So you tick that on the first probing path of that component. It will increment the component number and reset the feature number back to zero. So that's effectively what we've got on there is to say it's going to increment that component number, reset the feature back to zero, and you're going to end up with a, a human readable results file like this. So this is the results file Renishaw give out um, that we just link into then. So yeah, that is pretty much all from me. Um, I've run two minutes over for miles, so I apologize there, um, but I'm sure we can work something out as we go. So yeah, basically I'll, I'll hand over to miles and let him explain a bit more about the physical probes themselves. Um, 
just while Miles is getting set up, has anyone got any questions about um, inspect surface about part alignment? Or we can wait to the end and do questions at the end as well. It's not a problem. Richard, I'm still a bit confused on the uh, feed rate. You said when it was doing inspection, the feed rate needs to match how you calibrated. How is that? Yeah. Is that the case also for probing WCS? We'll start for probing or are those can cycles their own feed rate? So what, what we do is the can cycles are normally by the same uh, manufacturer that's doing the calibration for you. So you buy it as a package. So for like, for like on the Haas or on the, the, the Siemens, um, so they know the feed rate because it's been programmed into them. We don't unfortunately know that feed rate because it could be set at anything. So that's why for inspect surface, you need to write it in, but for the can cycles, it just knows what that feed rate is. That clarifies it, thank you. Cool. No worries. Um, we had you for a second. I think you, there you go, Miles. Gotcha. Um, so, kind of follow up with uh, what Richard was saying. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go over what's uh, probing on the actual Haas. Um, yeah, that works. Um, we kind of identify, you know, what your probing is going to be doing, uh, but in order to get the probing to work, you're going to need an initial setup. Um, that's kind of what I'm going to go over here. Uh, so the first part I'm going to go over is identifying the different parts of your probe for those of you who don't have a probe yet or not quite familiar with it. Uh, so the first thing you have is your spindle probe, also known as the OMP. Um, it looks something like this. Uh, it'll have a body on there as well. Um, you'll have your tool setter, the OTS, which looks something like this. This will always be in your machine off on the side, uh, probing tools. And last but not least is your machine interface, the OMI. Uh, and this is going to be mounted on one of the walls of your machine. I've got a question, is this a probe? No, this is what the probes use to, uh, I, to communicate with your house machine. Um, All right, um, again, we talked about a little bit about calibration. I'm gonna go a little bit, in, I'm gonna go more into the steps on how to calibrate your probe um, so you can get it running. Uh, so the first thing you're gonna do is check the OMP, the, uh, tool, uh, the spindle probe for run out, and then we're gonna check the OTS for flatness. Um, so in order to check your OMP for run out, uh, your spindle probe, what you're gonna do is take an indicator, as you can see here, uh, place it on the diameter of the ruby. And what you're gonna to wanna to do is there's, a, there's two screws on the top. There's four, uh, six screws all around. Uh, there's two on the top, one on here that I have highlighted and one on the opposite side. And what you're gonna do is break those loose uh, you don't want to you don't want to really loosen them. You just want to make it so it's no longer tight. Um, and then there's four screws on the bottom. I've highlighted two of them. Again, two of them on the opposite side. And what you're going to do is by hand rotate your um, probe and use these four screws on top to adjust the concentricity uh, of your probe. Uh, generally, what you would do is you're going to rotate it. Um, when you're going to find your low side, you're going to lightly loosen that side and then tighten the, uh, the opposite side uh, to, to adjust the concentricity. Uh, next is checking the OTS, your tool setter for flatness. Uh, but before you do that, um, it's a good idea to make sure the back of your probe back in here uh, is visible from the uh, OMI. Um, your OMI has 270 degrees of uh, view. So this allows you for a lot, uh, to put this almost anywhere on your machine. Um, and the way you would move this is bolt B right here. 
and loosen, you can take that out. And then it'll rotate in increments of 15, uh, 45 degrees in both directions, giving you a total of 90 degrees uh, to move uh, that. And once you have it in position, just put uh, bolt B back in and retighten that. But just for flatness, you're gonna have to do both front and back and left and right on this. Um, so you're just gonna take your indicator, uh, place it on your on the center of the probe, as close to center as you can. And you're going to remove bolt C. And this picture shows us bolt two. Uh, and then you use bolt D or bolt one in this picture, um, to adjust forward and back, uh, front and back. Uh, flatness. Uh, in both instances, in the flatness and the runout of your probes, uh, as a Haas, we usually try to keep it within two tenths of an inch, uh, so 0 0.0002. Uh, so once you've done that, you're going to retighten bolt C. And now you check your left to right um, flatness. Uh, so what you're going to use that is both these are labeled as bolt A uh, and you're going to use the left and right, you loosen one side and tighten the other side to um, get this in within that two tenths flatness. All right. Uh, so there's technically two different ways to calibrate your probe once you've uh, uh, once you set up run out and flatness. Uh, the first way is these steps three through five, where you calibrate the tool setter, calibrate the spindle probe, and calibrate the length. If you're on a newer, an NGC Haas machine, we have the complete calibration, which uh, essentially what that'll do is it'll have you fill out a template that will look something like something like this. Um, and essentially it'll tell you where you position your tool. Uh, you'll have to put in a tool length measurement, tool diameter measurement. Uh, Miles, are you showing, are you showing a, an image? Oh. It, didn't, it didn't come across. Oh, okay. Let me that? Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Um, so again, this is kind of what the template will look like. Uh, this will tell you, you know, position your tool, tool above the tool setter, your tool of known length and diameter. Uh, you put in that known length in there, your tool diameter in there. It's going to ask you what tools the uh, tool of known length and diameter in. Ask you what orientation is the tool setter in uh, with three being facing the left side of the tool and one being facing the right side of the tool, uh, machine, sorry. Uh, three, the left side of the machine, one the right side of the machine. And then the last question is, what is your spindle probe? What, what tool number is that? Uh, and once you do that, you can hit uh, cycle start to run an MDI as a temporary program and it will run through the complete calibration of your machine. Um, and it'll do all essentially all three of these steps in one, but it can be uh, argued that, you know, um, depending on the, cal the precision that you need, uh, some people don't like to use that and they'll do the other three steps. And essentially all these other three steps are going to have uh, that whole template just broken into three different templates. Uh, so the first thing it would do would be this. This video is the video showing. Let's see. This is what the calibration would look like. Um, this tool of known length and diameter, you can get a 
pre-made one. We have this one that was pre-made and we had labels put on there. Um, it can be very easily made with just a tool holder and a gauge pin. Uh, what we do recommend is once you do make your uh, known length and diameter, you keep that aside with the values on there because um, it is going to use that to reference your um, use as a reference for all your tool lengths and tool diameters. That, that double touch that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, so when it's doing calibration, it does do a double touch. The first touch is to find the surface, and the second one is to get an actual measurement. Nice. A more accurate. So that would be the first part, and again, if I did the complete calibration, that would be the first thing it does. Uh, the next thing would be calibrate the spindle probe uh, for length. And all you'd have to do for this is just call up the spindle probe uh, and essentially just hit cycle start. That's all that is. So this is going to be the main different uh, difference in here. Oh, I put complete calibration. That's what I want to do. Uh, so this is going to be the main the main difference. Um, if you go step by step, you will need a gauge ring in here. And essentially what you'll do, as, as you can see, you position the probe in the center of the gauge ring. Um, there'll be, the template will just ask how big is the gauge ring. You put that in um, and you'll, you'll run your, uh, it'll be very similar to a boring, uh, boring, uh, not boring cycle, a bore pickup. And it'll touch the different surfaces um, and get the diameter of your probe that way. Uh, if you do complete calibration, it will actually use the stylus of the tool setter to get the diameter of the uh, spindle probe. Essentially, you calibrated it with the tool of known length and diameter, and now it's going to use that calibration to calibrate this. Uh, So after that's done, the probe will stay there. You'll, you can jog it up and put it away. Um, so, so that would be your calibration steps. And once you've completed all, all of these steps, either one through five or one, two, and six, uh, once you've completed all of those, uh, you'll be able to probe any parts and get accurate measurements. Uh, so here is a list of all the probing cycles. There are different, a couple of different places you can probe from. Um, on your Haas, at least, you can probe from your offset page. Uh, and you'll get these images of the different kind of probing cycles. You have your bore, bore and boss for a circular um, feature, bore being a uh, cutout and boss being uh, extruded. Rectangular block and rectangular pocket, again, rectangular features. Uh, WebEx and PocketX will find the center of an X between two uh, parallel planes in the X direction. 
uh, web Y and pocket Y, find the center of Y between two parallel planes in the Y direction. Outside corner and inside corner, they find the point where X and Y meet. So what it will do is you'll position your probe over the, over the corner you want to probe. The probe will move in the X, move in the Y, based on which corner you told it. Um, these will always are positive values, and then it finds where those points meet. A single surface can be used to find the uh, position of a surface, either in the X, Y, or Z. And vice corner will find the outside corner, essentially the exact same way, but it'll also touch off Z. Um, the reason you would need to use some of these would be because uh, in Fusion, you know, you're setting up your part, uh, your Fusion you're setting up to run production, whereas this you need to set up the initial uh, work coordinate system. So that's what this is used for, setting up that initial work coordinate system. So uh, when you later run your program with the Fusion probing, uh, it has a reference of where that part is. Um, I guess to show, this is going to be uh, the code generated from the Haas machine opposed to from the uh, yeah, the can cycle is identical to the one that Fusion outputs. Um, so some of the other probing of, some of the probing you have on your machine is setting up your tools. Um, so there's a couple different options, or quite a few different options, I should say. Um, this probe manual, essentially what that is, is you position your probe 0.4 inches, uh, 10 millimeters above your tool setter, and essentially you just tell it this is where the part is, it'll go, sorry, where your tool is, and it'll just go straight down. This is really good for uh, tools you don't necessarily want to spin, uh, but they have uh, flutes that are uh, cutting edges that are not necessarily uh, next to each other. There's a space in between them or, or short, really short tools. Sometimes I've had issues where uh, probing manual length was just an easier way of uh, probing my part. Um, <clears throat> we have auto length non-rotating. Essentially what that is, is it'll Go down, go touch your tool off to the top of your uh, touch your tool off to this tool setter, um, and it won't rotate your tool at all. So this is good for something like a, a drill, a spot drill, anything that goes to a point. There's no reason to rotate it. The lowest point is that point. Uh, also, it can be it can be used for things like end mills, um, but it's not going to be as accurate as if I did a auto length rotating. Auto length rotating will do the exact same thing as a non-rotating, but it will spin your tool backwards. Uh, one thing you need to be cautious of when using this is if you're using a left-handed tool, um, there isn't a, as of right now, there's no way of uh, indicating whether it's a left-handed or right-handed tool. So it's going to spin it backwards, uh, assuming a right-handed tool. Uh, essentially what this will do, it'll come down, offset the radius of your tool so it's touching the middle of the surf, uh, middle of the probe, and it will find the lowest flute and the lowest point on your tool. Uh, the next option would be auto length diameter. And auto length diameter, again, it's gonna come down. It's gonna work exactly the same as rotating, but it will touch off the diameter of the tool uh, using the sides of the tool setter. Uh, the next few, uh, next couple are auto length sequential and auto length random. What these are used for is uh, auto length sequential. I can touch off tool one to tool 10. Uh, I can just go in my offsets page, set in the parameters that I want. Um, so essentially all that is, is I would go in, go to my offsets page. All the way to the right. I put in uh, a length for my tool, uh, a diameter, and it's based on what kind of 
probing type you're going to use. So if I'm using a non-rotating, I just need length. Um, if I use a non, if I use rotating, I need length and diameter. If I use length diameter, uh, if I do a length and diameter probing, I need approximate length, approximate diameter, and, and an edge measure height. And that's essentially edge measure height is just you know how far down does it need to go to get the maximum diameter. Uh, so if I said I wanted to probe tools one through ten. It's going to use the information in in this pay, offsets page. Um, you know, identify. Uh, what tools, how to probe them. Uh, so if I leave one as none, it'll actually skip that tool. Uh, auto length random allows you to spe specify 12 tools. I can say I want to do tool one, tool five, tool six, and tool three. It'll follow that order again uh, using those parameters that are in there. <clears throat> so the next two, uh, tool breakage length, non-rotating, tool breakage rotating. Uh, so essentially what these are used for is if I'm say doing a dr I'm drilling a bunch of holes, uh, but I want to make sure I'm going to drill and tap these holes. I want to make sure my drill didn't break halfway through. Because uh, if I broke my drill, I'm probably going to break my tap. So what I'm going to do is use these tool breakage lengths where I can set up a tolerance for my tool to say, hey, it's at a, my tool's either in tolerance, keep running, or my tool's out of tolerance, stop running uh, because I'm going to, you're going to break a tool. Uh, and again, if I use non-rotating uh, versus rotating, if I use rotating, I have the I have a higher degree of uh, accuracy because the tool is rotating. Uh, but if I'm using if I'm measuring a drill, I should use non-rotating because it goes to a point. Um, so your machine is able again. Um, you can use quick programs uh, to pick up your part. These can be used. Uh, pick up parts. So I go down here. Work. So I go in here. So if I had to create a pocket or uh, rectangular, yeah, if I did a rectangular pocket, um, I'd be given this template and go through, fill it out, say the size of X, size of Y, uh, and H and I, or if I wanted to offset that from the center. Uh, and then I can just easily uh, hit cycle start and run it in MDI mode. And essentially, that'll be just a temporary program that once I go to do another probing cycle, it will just overwrite that program. Uh, and then the other option, if I press F4 here, it gives me a couple more options. I can still output the MDI uh, by pressing the number two, and then I'll be able to again run as a temporary program. Another option would be creating a new program, which uh, in this case, Fusion would be much more effective in doing this because then you have to hand write all that code. Uh, but I can insert a clipboard uh, for something. So, uh, tool breakage check. Oh, what they doing there? Um, so as I said, it'll do the tool, ask for a tool number, tool length offset, uh, the diameter your tolerance on that tool to say essentially if it's out of tolerance, um, alarm out and say this tool's broken. Or you can say you can have it alarm out or you can just have it flag the tool. Um, and then you can choose what you want at the end of that code. Uh, if you want to M0, the stop machine, M01 for uh, optional stop or M30 to end the program. And this would be something more effective. I could go, you know, I need to put in Cool diameter. Um, so here I could go F4. I'll put the uh, clipboard, and I could go in here and place this somewhere in my program um, to check to make sure that tool is not broken. So now that code is in there and I can, every time this uh, program runs, it'll run that, those lines of code. Um, so continuing on, uh, some additional things to keep uh, in mind is uh, you should always keep two, uh, so 
So each probe uses two one half AA batteries, not your standard AA battery. Uh, so we always recommend uh, keeping extras at your shop. Each probe takes two, so you might want to keep an extra set just in case. Uh, and if you were to want to change them on your spindle probe, this back, uh, this back part just unscrews and they pop right out and they'll show you the direction you need to be in. Uh, and then on your spindle probe, uh, there's a little keyway you can see on there. Uh, if you open it up, again, that pops out and it takes uh, batteries in and out uh, that way. Um, one thing though, be able to check is to make sure your probe is properly working. Uh, so I put two sets of codes in here. Um, essentially, it'll turn on your probe and essentially look for a touch. Uh, and if your probe doesn't turn on, it'll give you an alarm saying your probe isn't turning on. Uh, and at that point, there's a pretty good chance that the batteries are just dead. Uh, so this looks something like this. I put this program in, hit cycle start. So I'm started. And now I know that my probe, my probe is probably picking up uh, touches and is turning on. Same thing with the probe. Um, one thing, I guess, uh, one last sort of thing, uh, anytime you're running any kind of, uh, can cycle for your probe that, uh, it's called P9810, uh, uh, that protected positioning movement, uh, that is going to be in the background of every can cycle. And essentially what that is going to do is if the probe hits something unexpected, it will stop the probe. You don't have to worry about, you know, I told the probe to go down six inches and it only has three inches to move. Um, it's going to break. If, as long as your probe is on and has that uh, protected cycle on in the background, it won't just continue going. It'll hit it, alarm out saying an unexpected surface was found, and it'll move back up. It'll retract back to its original spot. Besides that, I think that's everything I have. Yeah, I believe that's it. Is there any questions? I figure we can open this up now. Maybe we've got, we parked a half hour. Maybe we need that, maybe we don't. Um, my thought was if, if you're attending the webinar here, obviously there was a, you know, some kind of education you're coming for to, you know, questions that you wanted to ask or things you needed to learn. Um, I just want to make sure if you you came and spent your time with us, I want to make sure your, your time is well spent. Is there anything else that we could have covered or things that you wanted to ask? Um, one thing that I, I was getting on um, uh, some chats through text that someone was asking, they were looking to join, but I know we showed everything on a mill, but how would that apply? I'm just throwing you guys another wrench here, but how would that apply on the lathe? You know, say if I, could I do the inspection surface, Richard? Could I you know, Miles, is, does this change things up when you go to a lathe and use a probe? Like what, I guess, how would, how would that switch up on a lathe? Um, Richard, you're muted, by the way. It does help when I unmute. Um, so there's currently, we haven't got the posts released for the, the half of the lathes, um, but you can do this on a lathe. There's nothing stopping you doing it. The only problem is you're, you're just very limited, really, in what you can probe on a lathe. Um, yeah, if you've, if you've only got a two axis lathe, then there's very little you can actually probe on there. So, yeah, because you, you can never go down beneath the, the center line um, to probe anything un underneath there normally. So, yeah, we, right. we don't we haven't prioritized the work on the lathes, but if enough people are asking for them, then they'll get some more priority. Okay. So, like, I guess I'm, I'm imagining a mill turn part or like a part that has some milling features and you wanted to probe it, right? I guess you would do, you could use essentially the same kind of functionality, but you're saying the post isn't quite ready there in Fusion yet. Yeah, so it's a bit different then. So if, you're, if, you're, if you've got a proper, you know, multi-axis lathe, um, then yeah, we'd, we'd have to get you a custom post over, but there's no reason why that wouldn't be much effort because it's the same code as the milling code really. Because you, you're not you're not rotating the part while you're probing it, so. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, and we also find that a lot of times uh, with lathes, you generally just have a tool setter rather than a spindle probe. 
Um, because one of the bigger concerns about a lathe over a mill having a probe in it is uh, your probe, like any other tool on a lathe, it's always in play. So your probe is going to be getting my chips, which it would be able to withstand. Uh, but that's just another thing you're worrying about while you're machining a probe. Yeah, a big, a big bird's nest of swarf wrapping around your probe isn't, isn't exactly what you want. Yeah. Quickly, like you could quickly damage that probe that's sitting in your turret. Uh, I guess what you're saying, right? Yeah, when, when they're a couple of thousand each, you know, it's it's a very fragile piece of ceramic to have. Sitting there. Yeah. Is there, well, I guess on that note, is there a reason or a specific use case where you would want to have a probe in your turret on a lathe with a, like a multi-axis lathe? D depends on what parts you're making. You know, if, if every probe, every part, you can argue it needs probing. It's just a case of quantity versus, you know, if, if you're a Swiss shop, you're not going to spend the time probing parts. Right. Uh, but yeah, it, it all depends on the part really. It's difficult. Makes sense. And again, I'm just, I'm just spitballing questions to everyone. If, if uh, again, feel free to unmute your mic and jump in if there's something that you wanted to, to ask the, uh, you know, the two experts that are on the call. I figured just, uh, it's a good time just to, to chime in. Okay. Um, yeah, I, mean, th I think one thing I want to say to everyone is, um, yeah, of course, can't really contact us directly as such, but again, we spend a lot of time on the forums. So please put any questions out there on the forums. Um, I'd be annoyed if, like, if there's any probing questions on the forum that I don't catch. You know, normally I get them within a day, but depending on commitments, it might be a little bit longer. But please just pipe on the forums. Let me know of any, any questions that you've got, um, and I'll do my best to help you, really. Um, from a, and, and Miles, maybe this is you, maybe this is Neil, but from a, a cost perspective, spe specifically looking at a Haas, you know, mill, how much additional, and I, I probably could look this up myself, but I mean, just how much would it be to add a pro? Like when you were purchasing a brand new machine, because I mean, I see all the benefits from it, you know, not having bought a new Haas myself, but what would that look like as far as adding a probe onto your machine tool? Uh, so looking at, at the house price list, we're under 7,000 for the probe. I think it's actually closer to six. And that gives you the spindle probe and the um, table probe along with the Inspection Plus software and all the backend templates to use on the Haas uh, machines. Got it. And so someone told me this once, and I don't know if there's any validity to it, but you want to order that with the new machine or when you purchase a machine versus trying to retrofit that afterwards. Is that true? Is it's, there's a different cost. Um, I mean, cost wise, it's pretty much the same thing. The only difference you're going to have is you're going to be looking at, uh, probably some, uh, labor for the, uh, the dealer to come in cause they're not going to, they're going to have to come in for separate visit, get all set up. You're going to have to get all the other, um, options that come included with the probe loaded up into the, um, the machine you know that's a point to make too with the Haas probes when you get that run shot package you're also going to get macros for the machine you're going to get coordinate scaling and rotation for the machine you're going to get uh, spindle orient so you know with that six thousand six five hundred dollar purchase you're getting uh like thirty five hundred dollars in control options as well at no charge mm -hmm. okay that makes sense. And that's, I, I, I know that a couple of our, like, like Richard, a couple of our Autodesk team members have Haas machines, uh, you know, we have some for our tech centers, but I know we have some that have, some Autodesk team members who have Haas's in their own garages, their own personal shops, and they've kind mm -hmm. of played around with the functionality and they, they're able to run lights out machining while they're working, you know, doing their day job because they have the probing functionality set up. Like they're using probing, probe geometry to update tool offsets and, you know, while they're not even in front of their machine, which is great. You know, it's a it's definitely added benefit. Yes, it, it, it's been good. And I mean, we, we find a lot of customers that don't have it. They fight it for a long time and they get that first one in and then we're going in to retrofit all their older equipment because no one knows, you know, knows how to, touch off tools anymore and they they never knew how they did it in the past so it's definitely one of those things that you don't need but once you get it you just you want to have it yeah it's like a tool presetter and a lathe when when i in tool presetter is not on lathe like you didn't want to just put the little bit extra money for the, the presetter because it just helps a lot you know i can imagine that's it's a manual such a manual process to set all that stuff up
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard the same thing as, as we've toured different HVOs and talked to different customers. They said, you know, I, in hindsight, I should have put the money in to just get the probing because once I got one for a certain machine, it just, yeah, it's like it, the light bulb clicks. Like, yeah, I, that makes sense. The value was there. I just didn't, you know, realize. And that's kind of like the, the whole, the whole point of this webinar was kind of to educate why this stuff is needed, whether, you know, whether it's with fusion or any other machine tool, it's just, we need to continue to promote the technology that's already out there and people to use it. You know, you, it's already, it's been in the market. We just, you know, I don't think we use it enough. There's not enough education around it. Exactly. Cool. Anyone else have another opportunity before we, uh, I guess we sign off. If anyone wants to unmute or add in the chat, I mean, if you don't have a great mic, my I, apparently mine was acting like a robot earlier, so uh, feel free to chime in. All right, going once, going twice. If not, I mean, I, I guess on the forums, obviously Richard said he's, he's pretty active. I know he's pretty active there. Um, we will send a follow-up email with uh, all the links that Miles has provided and Richard has provided, uh, as well as a link to our partner, Allendale Machinery, who is out in New Jersey. So um, any questions about Haas or questions about um, Fusion 360, you know, you'll have all the links and a link to the recording, which we'll put up on our Fusion YouTube page after um, all of this is over. And uh, again, if there's any other topics or anything that you guys would want to see us cover, please feel free to reach out. We always like feedback as feedback's a gift. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for joining. Uh, thanks again, Richard. Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Neil, for, for jumping on. Uh, we do appreciate it. And I um, hope everyone stays safe, and we'll catch you next time. Great. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.